Good morning, everybody. Um, can we have the slides, please? Great. So, when I was in grad student uh, at the University of California, Davis, I went there to do my PhD. Looked at Guelph, but Guelph weren't, weren't taking American time for grad students. And so I went to UC Davis um, and became very interested in really fluorinated compounds. And these are the fluorines, and you are going to see a lot of structure. So you'll remember high school uh, chemistry, I hope. There are two major ones. Perflora, perfluorooctanoic acid, that means it has eight carbons. Perfluorooctane sulfonate, the O again, is eight carbons. And there's a sulfonate and there's a carboxylate. These are the reason PFAS is an issue. All, these are in your blood at microgram per liter concentrations, PPBs. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's the kind of concentration you, when you take pharmaceuticals, that, that level. So these are high concentrations. I don't think it really matters. I don't think they're very toxic. I'll show you some things later about that. Uh, at least these are not, but they're incredibly persistent. They do not. Sorry, My goodness. What is PFAS? Yeah. I'll get. Sorry, very hard. alkyl substances. So the alkyl is just carbons bonded to each other. So that's PFAS. Yes, another question. <laughs> okay, I can. I got three things. All right. Um, so yeah, per or poly, and these are polyfluorinated acids, and that's a, important. But these do not degrade. They are very recalcitrant. They redefine persistence. DDT, which was, of course, the first persistent insecticide that caused lots of grief, will last about 10-year half-life in soil. That used to be viewed as a really long time until these things came along. And I don't know, 10,000 years, they're still not going to degrade under uh, normal environmental conditions. Their eventual fate will be in the ocean. So how did I get interested in fluorine? Well, in January of 1989, I attended a presentation by Joel Colts. He was a University of Iowa professor, ag farmer. And he put this structure up the board, teflutherin forest used in corn for corn rootworm uh, in the United States. And I, it's been sold a little bit here. But here is my interest in this. I'm building a house on my farm. You know, my daughter was the architect. And how you put a house together, you put the roof up the top, you put doors and windows. There, there are reasons why things are located where they are. Well, in a molecule, we talk about the chemical architecture. And the chemical architecture of this, this is a pyrethroid, so pyrethrin-like. All pyrethrins have an ester, this function here, usually have this um, three-membered ring, and you usually have something over here on this side. Fluorine was put into this molecule for two primary reasons. Whenever you see fluorine in a, in a pesticide or a pharmaceutical, and I'll show you some later, is to pull electron density out of that ring. It deactivates it to bacteria's ability to degrade the molecule. It literally is selfish. Fluorine is the most selfish member of the periodic table. So it pulls electron density, reducing really the attractiveness for oxidation, the attractiveness to degrade. So these fluorines were put on these double bonds to deactivate degradation of that ring. And they were put on this double bond here to deactivate that double bond. What did we use before fluorine? We used chlorine. And, and most insecticides pesticides were chlorinated. 30 or 40 years ago, we shifted to fluorine because it's better and safer and it works overall. The second reason, which I found super fascinating, the fluorines are also put on there so that this molecule is semi-volatile. So you would think if you'd put a corn applied insecticide in the soil, that the root of exposure to that corn rootworm would be absorption across the skin of the rootworm. That's not how it works. It actually evaporates into the interstitial soil spaces, the gaps in the soil, and the rootworm inhales it. That's the root of getting there. So long story to say why I became interested in fluorine as a component of chemical architecture is because it acts different than every other thing and we know relatively little about it. So I've published 
more than 200 papers on this topic. Um, and most of those were sort of first uh, in that realm. But this is where I got my start. Uh, I do farm in Northumberland County, very, 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 very sandy soil. It, when, I did yin last year and, and you see the yin results and it, that sand result, I'm the most extreme on one side. Lisa knows she farms in the general area. There you see the rotation. I love azukis, big money, no-till mostly, lots of cover crops, amendments, lots of moon manure, compost, biosolids, paper solids. I'll talk a little bit about that. I only got them one year. Um, so there's the picture of the compost. Um, there's the paper biosolids. There's the, the biosolid pellets. And then I trade lots of hay and straw to a cattle farmer for manure. And he told me yesterday, I owe you 58 more triaxles. I was a very happy guy. Because with that sandy soil, I, I, I definitely need that. But I do have a study going on on biosolids pellets now. Um, so here's the outline for this talk. What are they? Poly and perthalin and alkyl substances. There's your definition of PFAS. Why are some persistent? I'll try to put toxicity in perspective because I do think there are things to worry about. The problem is the world has just labeled all PFAS as bad. And in fact, the European Union is trying to ban all of them. And I think it's a horrible mistake. Uh, what is the difference between PFAS and PFOS? A common misconception. This is an individual chemical. This is a class that with at least 12,000 individuals in it, one versus 12,000. Putting measurements into perspective, because at the end of the day, most of the fluorinated chemicals in your soil came from rainwater. Nothing we add really does much to, to make it worse. But I'll give you that as a final thing. And then really, what is the impact? Benefits versus risk. They often get labeled as forever chemicals. And the ones I showed you up front sort of deserve that moniker, meaning on our time scales, they do not ever degrade. Mother Nature has not figured out how to deal with these. They are unique, meant to capture the potential. The reality though is most PFAS do degrade. I only, I try not to say forever, I just say the F word and I don't like it. Uh, I think it labels a whole class of chemistry uh, with a negative pejorative label and it's super unhelpful and it completely removes what the OECD is trying to do is to ban the entire use of the, this whole class of chemical, which then, of course, removes the ability to innovate and produce uh, much safer alternatives. I have a PhD student who just defended two weeks ago. He worked on some Merck chemistry from Merck AG out of, out of Europe, out of Germany. The molecule is designed to work in place because fluorine is unique, but as soon as it's released into the environment, it degrades back to basic starting materials. It is a green alternative. It works in place. It doesn't become an environmental pollutant. That too would be banned. So 12,000 individual chemicals, massive use. Firefighting foams, there's nothing better. The carbon fluorine bond is the strongest single bond that we know of, number one. So it it's withstands great thermal stress. Fluorinated chemicals, if you build them right, if the architects are right, they're the best surfactants ever. They're a hundred to a thousand times better than a hydrocarbon surfactant. I just wash my hands in the washer. Yes, men wash their hands. That soap is a hydrocarbon soap, doesn't last very long. Wouldn't be very good in firefighting foam. But these fluorinated chemicals, thermally stable, they're incredible surfactants, they suppress fires, they're really irreplaceable in that. Huge amounts of industrial commercial surfactants in wetting, wetting agents, chemically resistant plastic, non-stick coatings, electronics. Um, and up here, many more includes food contact paper chemicals. Anybody in here who ever has eaten microwave popcorn, got a huge dose of, uh, what I'll call it PAPS, is fluorinated surfactant. Why else does the grease not go through the paper? Well, it's coated with these fluorinated chemicals. So a bunch of different molecules, uh, insecticides, herbicides, Prozac, the pharmaceutical, trifluoromethyl group, Fipronil, one of my favorite insecticides, has got fluorine in two different locations. We published a nice paper on that. Pantoprosol is a pharmaceutical. 
When we run uh, analysis of human blood samples, I will always see this compound and this compound. These both would be banned in the European Union, which is crazy. Uh, there's Zidwa. I applied this for the first time last year. I loved it, uh, its efficacy. It's the cleanest field I had. Um, Safluphenicil, we published uh, a paper on this. this, is Aragon. Lots of us use that. All of these in the European Union would be say, no, you can't use fluorine anymore because maybe it will be persistent. All of these degrade in the environment in relatively fast fashion. And the problem is if we ban the use of fluorine, what will in fluoxetine, Prozac, for example, what will that be replaced with? The CF3 is there to deactivate metabolism on that ring. So to give it a lifetime in the body to be able to do what it is meant to do. So it will be replaced with either chlorine, because it also is electronegative, it's selfish, or nitro groups, NO2 groups. Boy, oh boy, would that increase the toxicity and the hazard, the byproduct, the, the side effect aspects of pharmaceuticals if we had to go that route. That would be a big step backwards. So this is just to tell you there's a lot of different chemical architectures and they all act different in the environment. They have different fates, they have different times to degrade because the architecture is different, so it matters. One example, we published a paper on this, it was just a what if, the architecture of this molecule, it's a perfluorinated amine. It's a heat transfer fluid, meaning it's just a coolant used in highly specialized applications and it should have never been used in commerce. It should have never been. Even my undergrad students would look at that structure and I say, okay, what's going to happen that in the environment? Nothing. We understand a lot about how mother nature now degrades chemicals, what the mechanisms are, what the reagents are, how it works. That molecule, nothing happens. It will last at least 800 years. Its ultimate fate is finally diffusion to outer space, in effect, to the thermosphere where it gets really hot and burns up. The problem with it is, it is the world record holder for global warming potential at 7,100 times that of CO2. It's a world record holder because it has so many fluorines and carbon fluorine bonds absorb infrared, that's heat, right in the atmospheric window. So it's the worst possible thing to be using and releasing because it has no Achilles heel. There's nothing in that molecule that allows mother nature to degrade it. Um, and we published this paper in a de decent journal just to make a point. So the most common refrigerant is HFC-134A. It replaced DuPont, we discovered this molecule, we replaced Freons that were really damaging the Earth's environment uh, through ozone depletion. Anybody in here has had any uh, uh, visitation of skin cancer or know anybody that that ozone depletion aspect is a, was a real problem. It solved that problem. This, of course, unfortunately degrades in the atmosphere pretty much 100% to trifluoroacetic acid. This is a PFAS. This does not degrade in the environment. I don't care. It doesn't bioaccumulate, it's not toxic. We save the world from uh, ozone depletion, but some people care a lot because I don't know if a million years from now, this will be causing a problem. But boy, oh boy, if I had to pick my problems, ozone depletion was a real problem. Um, this one is not, but this is driving some of the re reaction. So let's get to why you all have these chemicals in your body at relatively high concentrations. Just because, well, Teflon is not ever part of this, uh, except in high uh, uh, temperature environments. Most of the polymers and surfactants are like this. There's a fluorinated tail that, here's the uniqueness of fluorine. You can have water repellent chemistries and you can have oil repellent chemistries but they're never the same except with fluorine. Fluorine is both repels oils and repels water. That's its unique property. There's, there's no replacement for that. And that's why that tail is put on polymers that are applied to carpets or clothes. And then there's your popcorn bag. These surfactants, these are phosphates. That part of the molecule is what you put on your soil for phosphorus. But this part delivers that hydro, water, and oil repellency. And then a lot of these are used in AFFF firefighting foams. 
That's a picture on something like June 1st, 2020 at, at Pearson Airport. That's a Tobacco Creek. Uh, these guys, I don't can't explain uh, what they were doing, but uh, 220 kilograms of PFOS was released into that stream along with all these surfactants. But this is the number one source of contamination in the environment. And the reason is these molecules, that's the Achilles heel. These are esters, they degrade. That's easy to break either in your body or in bacteria or just even in water releasing a volatile alcohol that we've measured in the atmosphere. It can fly all over, including to the Arctic, Arctic, and then through degradation mechanisms, turns into perfluorinated acids. So this is what we use in commerce. These are degradable, producing something that's not degradable. And the mechanism in the atmosphere, we've published a whole bunch of papers, 40 or so, totally figuring out what happens to these molecules in the atmosphere? They degrade, they make lots of small things, some of which will eventually turn into just the starting materials, fluoride, carbon dioxide, et cetera. But then some of them are perfluorinated acids. And that's a bit of the problem. So when we go around and measure rainwater uh, from three locations, Delaware, Vermont, and New York, we can find the products. Mother Nature is really good at degrading things we put up in the atmosphere. Most of what goes up in the atmosphere is natural organic compounds from trees and, and grasses, et cetera. You walk in a pine forest, it smells good. Those are terpenes that are being uh, off gas from the trees. Mother Nature is very good at degrading those. Well, she does the same thing to chemicals we put up there for the most part. But the products of those, these perfluorinated acid, PFOA, that's what's in your body, that's that eight carbon compound, we can measure them in the rainwater all over the world, actually. And in fact, when we go all over the world and look at PFAS in soils, North America, all the way to, we've got one sample of Antarctica, and there's some, not a lot, but some, but seven versus 26 to 48 in South America, Australia, 44 to 297, Europe, up to thousands. Basically, everywhere in the world we look, we find this stuff in soil at relatively high concentrations. So the, the take home message from this talk, most of what's on your farm in the soil came from the atmosphere, came from rain. Why is it in the atmosphere? Because it was off gassing from uses by humans, carpets, um, uh, clothing wear, industrial uses uh, and food packaging and, and those kinds of things. Extremely persistent because the when you take a perfluorinated tail, these are just carbons hooked with fluorines and an acid on the end, this never degrades. Sulfonates never degrade. Phosphonates never degrade. I put this up here because about 10 years ago, we started measuring this in agricultural uh, applications across Canada. It was probably used as a wetting agent in some sprays uh, in agricultural sprays they have since pulled it because they're afraid because this is also very persistent and we've measured some of that in human blood as well so here's some some things we learned size matters in these perfluorinated compounds you need we took a bunch of fish fed them put put uh acids these perfluorinated chemicals in water and measured bioconcentration factors on the y-axis here versus chain length. And what we, what we learned is each additional lengthening of that chain as CF2 results in a 7x increase in bioconcentration factor. The take home message though, is that you have to have at least seven carbons with fluorine. This is eight carbon overall, because one carbon is there in the acid. Anything to the right of this line longer or larger than perfluoroheptanoic acid, seven, is bioaccumulative. And all I mean by that is if it's in Lake Ontario and there's a fish swimming in Lake Ontario, that molecule, if it has at least seven carbons with fluorine, will bioaccumulate into that fish and we can measure it in the fish. And the, the more uh, CF2 groups it has, the higher the concentration will be in the fish. On this side, no matter what, that fish swimming in that water, none of the chemical is going to end up in the fish. This paper um, 
couple papers we published back in 2003. Shortly after, the world's chemical companies shifted. They all had eight carbon chemistry before, and I'm primarily talking about the DuPonts, 3Ms, Asahi, Clarion, uh, a few others. Um, they all shifted. Oops. Oops, back, back. They all shifted to the left of this line, to four carbons and six carbons chemistry. And they did it for chemical architecture reasons. They figured out how to make it work in, in the application, but when it got released, it would not produce a bioaccumulative product. And to me, that's a huge plus. We altered the chemical architecture for a safer, better uh, outcome on the environmental perspective, on the human and um, fish, et cetera, exposure. That was a great thing. Now, the products of those reactions were still the same. They're still persistent. They're just not bioaccumulative. And this matters usually to regulators. So 25 or so years ago, we really got into this because we, we had done some measurement of polar bears, getting polar bear livers to sample is not easy, folks. And then human contamination. And the reality is, even back in 1968, there was evidence for two forms of fluorine, fluoride at the time in human serum. One inorganic, i.e. fluoride, just like when you brush your teeth, and the other is the organic form. They didn't know what it was. Taves didn't know what it was. Turns out it was PFOS, perfluorooctane sulfonate, the 3M chemical uh, known as Scotchgard. But you find PFOS in humans. This, these are numbers that would represent, well, a little while ago, we've made some progress. These numbers are down more like 10 now in you. All of you have this in your body. All of you have all these in your body, but all the concentrations are lower than they were back in 2004. Um, and we wanted to know why. How is it possible? And just to jump to the end, we've made a huge amount of progress. Back in 99, 2000, these were the concentrations. Ever since, really, 3M pulling, government starting to regulate, all these concentrations are down one and a half parts per billion of PFOA, of PFOA and probably about five or so of PFOA. So this is, this is good progress. It's ironic to me that now suddenly the world wants to ban these chemicals when we've made such progress for the last two and a half decades. So this is a paper we published uh, in humans looking a little more selectively. Uh, we have some analytical techniques that other people didn't have at the time. And, and you find the sulfonic acids and the carboxylate. These are things I just talked about. They're there. But there's a whole bunch of other things there as well. And we believe you're contaminated primarily because you have these other things in your body. These PAPs, these are the chemicals on that food contact paper in the popcorn bags. These are the 3M version of those, and we can measure all these at relatively high concentrations in your blood. The thing is, these degrade. They metabolize rather quickly. Now, I can't experiment with my graduate students, although some would like to, so we use rats instead to stand in for a typical grad student. So we took chemicals that we found in human blood, this, this popcorn bag chemical, dose the rat, and really what you find is that the PAPs, we dose it, we can see it go up in the blood and then very quickly degrade. And out the other side, perfluorooctanoic acid. And it stays much longer, its excretion time is longer, it sticks around in the body longer, so this proved this connection. The manufacturer at the time, DuPont, I called them out as a positive force last time. In 2001, 2002, they were fighting me vigorously to say, there is no connection between this chemical and PFOA. You are wrong. I think we've been proven right and they've agreed to it, but they've been hit with multi-billion dollar lawsuits since and they've lost, unfortunately for them. So here's why it matters. There is toxicological worries here. There really are. In your blood, we can measure uh, those surfactants that you produce EFTO. I'm sure nobody in here drinks to excess, but ethanol is why, why we drink. F, this is ethanol. A CH2, a, ethanol is CH3, CH2OH. That's ethanol with one hydrogen replaced by this tail. That's the difference. So you all have experience with this chemistry because you take ethanol and turn it into acetaldehyde. That's what causes headaches. 
You then take acid aldehyde and oxidize it to uh, a carboxylic acid, acetic acid. I don't know if you know that, but you drink ethanol and you go to the bathroom and release lots of acetic acid, vinegar. So rats like us do exactly the same thing to this chemicals because it looks exactly like ethanol. We take it to the aldehyde, the aldehyde to the acid. Unfortunately here, there's lots of other things that can happen. You can lose HF across that bond to form this molecule. Unequivocally, I cannot draw a more toxic chemical structure on a board than that. It is incredibly reactive at that carbon. Glutathione, which is your protective measure, mechanism to dealing with toxic chemicals, reacts with it very, very quickly and it gets excreted. But it's like wearing a bulletproof vest and the bullet just didn't get you. And eventually, as you get older and what part of the aging process, is that your glutathione doesn't work as well. Your Kevlar vest has been shot so many times, it's got some holes in it. And so over time, this molecule reacts with things that you don't want it to, like nucleic acids or uh, amino acids and proteins and, and DNA. So anyway, there are real toxicological issues here. We've published a bunch of papers on that. I haven't interested the world too much. The toxicologists, they keep going back and saying, no, but we want to study PFOA. Eh, but foe is not very toxic. So here's one of the chemicals, sorry, I did that again. Here's one of the chemicals you make, the a 2 fto acid. This molecule right here, just like acetic acid vinegar that you produce from ethanol, this is what comes from this molecule. So we took that molecule, the 10 carbon version, and dosed it with Daphnia magna. Daphnia magna is the best test for an aquatic toxic chemical. It's like the canary in the coal mine. It's the most susceptible. It's been around for 50 years looking at its toxicity because it, it's so sensitive. Well, this thing is incredibly toxic, 10,000 times more toxic than PFOA. So the whole world's excited about PFOA. The whole world is trying to ban things because of PFOA. They don't mention this compound at all, and yet it's 10,000 times more toxic. It's, it's a problem, and it's probably because it delivers hydrofluoric acid inside the cell. You don't want hydrofluoric acid inside your cell. HF dissolves glass. You know, it's not a, it's not a nice compound. And I point this out. I would expect a thousand citations for this. We did this with uh, Keith Solomon and Paul Simbley at Guelph. Um, very nice. We also, with Keith and Paul, put, there are, they had farm ponds out at the Turfgrass Institute, 10,000 liter farm ponds we put in uh, milligram per liter quantities. Notice I told you you have microgram per liter quantities in your blood, so a thousand fold higher. Uh, this is the Keen shoe ad, I wear Keen shoes. I, didn't, I was not happy with them because PFC fees are not extremely toxic. Drives me nuts. But EPA has gone overboard in my view. These compounds, what this data says is that the, no observ the lowest observed effect concentration is between, no data on the laboratory, but 30 to 70 milligrams per liter, 428,000 times greater than the advisory drinking water limit that the EPA set. Let that sink in. So I did publish a paper, Fate of Polyfluoroalkylphosphate Diasters uh, in Biosolids Applied Soil Biogradation Uptake back in 2013 is really on paper solids and some biosolids from Toronto. Um, here's the one take home message. Before and after, applying on the soil, before and after, you cannot measure a difference. Why? Because I already told you, most of that on my farm, that field there, um, had these acids, these PFAS already in the soil coming from rainwater, adding Paper biosolids and compost and some biosolids didn't add anything different to the soil. So we're doing a pellet study uh, uh, on behalf of the Biosolids Council. There are the pellets. I got uh, 41 tons or so from Toronto. Uh, I have a control field. There's the rate, 2.5. I have 16 acre field, 41 tons. You can do the math. Uh, cover crops, oak peas, and sunflowers this last summer. Uh, this year, old plant corn. We've done soil pre and post application. 
And here's the, here's the data. There are the chemicals, a whole bunch of them. These are those chemicals in the popcorn bag, and we see those in the biosolids, which is pretty surprising. I didn't think these things were used anymore, but if it's in a biosolid pellet, it went through you or your kin living in Toronto. So we're talking post-human exposure. What you can see, we can't measure that in the soil after application. So there was the soil samples pre-application, post-application. And of course I have PFOS in my soil, 0.37, plus or minus 0.2. Post-application, 0.38, plus or minus 0.71. Those are indistinguishable. The not bioamended, this is an adjacent field, closer to Highway 22, Lisa, uh, you can still measure it. PFOA is the other biggie, 1.31, 0 0.2, even post-treatment was less, because that's the vagaries of, of measurement science, just uh, diversity around the field. Here's the take home message. Adding two and a half tons of biosolid to that field, uh, sampling down to six inches, um, this was gently incorporated with an RTS, Sal Ford set at about an inch and a half or two inches. Uh, you cannot measure a difference in application of that compound. Is this where you're taking over? You go. Can we pause here for a second? Any questions? We're going to do questions at the end too, if you want to wait, but I just, everybody got their chemistry hat on. You, you're going to win the question or what? I, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so my takeaway here is that you're saying there's no appreciative addition of PFOS to our soil if we were to use biosolid pellets. Is that my takeaway? I listened. Thank you. So you said the word PFOS. PFOS is one chemical. PFAS is the whole class. Just to... Just to and we're going to have a whole bunch of summary comments here in a minute. So I'm glad I didn't have to give that chemistry lesson. So the, the rest of this is going to be putting it into perspective with organic amendments. And the first thing I just want to, to mention, and, and this helped for me, putting parts per million, parts per billion, and parts per trillion into perspective. So one part per million is like one second in 11.6 days. Pretty small. One part per billion is like one second in 300 years, 300 and something years. One part per trillion is like one second in 31,700 years. So put that into perspective. Like it's, these are really, really, really small numbers. And when you look in, in Scott's chemistry lab, the equipment he has to be able to measure those minute chemistry, we couldn't do that probably 20 years ago. So people can measure more things and, and it's a scare tactic in a way because if people don't know the difference between parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion, there's something there, it's scary. So that's part of the message. Anyway, so, so we did a few um, studies, and this is just the biosolids ana analysis of what Scott put on his field. And so to put it in perspective, if, so the CFIA recently put in a, a standard, and it's based on some of the things that are happening in the States. And so in May of 2023, CFIA proposed an interim standard that requires biosolids that be, are being applied to the soil to be measured. And if it has more than 50 parts per billion of PFOS, then it can't be applied. So that's a number, that's a measurement. I'm gonna take that and, and just use that number to put it into perspective. So we wouldn't be able to do this, but if you took the biosolids pellets and you said, okay, at what point, if it was at 50 parts per billion, what would that mean in an application rate? basic applicate. So it would take approximately six and a half tons of biosolid pellets that, that Scott used that has a 7.65 part per billion PFOS number to reach that 50 part per billion limit. That's on a dry matter basis. So six and a half tons, approximately, if we were applying that rate, we would be applying approximately 570 pounds of total nitrogen, almost a thousand pounds of total phosphorus, 16 pounds of potash, because 
biosolids doesn't have much potash, and about 10 pounds of copper. We would be doing far more harm with the nutrients we applied than with the PFAS. We, probably, we would definitely kill the, plot, the, the crop. And this is research that was done at Scott's farm. It would require about 36 tons per acre for the average background soil concentration to double. So those are, that's the reason that when Scott showed those numbers of pre and post application that you didn't see a difference because the rates are, are just so small. So we also did a compost study at Scott's farm looking at food waste compost, green bin compost from Clarington or from uh, Miller compost. And the, this is just showing the available nutrients at a per ton per acre. We were getting about 60 pounds of nitrogen in the first year, about 20 pounds of nitrogen in the second year, about 82 pounds of available phosphorus and about 130 pounds of potash. So just to, to put the, the benefits into perspective. And when we did the, the this was a, a compost study that was done for a number of years. And because Scott's a researcher, he understands the value of long-term and having the check plots in place. So this was a map. This was a map that was taken about, I don't know, eight years later. And you can very distinctly see the zero checks where we didn't apply compost. And then we had different rates of compost that we applied in the field. And you can definitely see the benefits in, in that soil health map where we applied the compost versus where we didn't. And if you look at the yields over those number of years, um, the change in yield from the composted plots versus the checks, always a benefit. But look at in 2018, and that was a really dry year. That was a year where, where there was a, a, quite a bit of drought stress. Having that extra water holding capacity, having that extra organic matter made a huge difference in the yield with the compost plots versus with the check plots. It's hard to put a dollar value on organic matter. It's hard to put a dollar value on water holding capacity. But here are some of the benefits that we're getting with organic amendments. And not just compost, uh, biosolids, biosolids pellets, they all have significant organic matter. And part of the benefits, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes on, on just the benefits, because the microorganisms don't break down the PFAS, but they add other things to the soil that help with those benefits. And We've got a, a variety of, of microbial populations when we add organic amendments. Those working together provide humus that is a combination of fungi, bacteria, nematodes, protozoa, and arth arthropods, and earthworms. And those are working together to make that humus, and, and we could spend a whole day lecture on just that part of it. But these are some of the benefits that we're getting with organic amendments that we have to put in perspective when we're talking about some of the risks. So this is the compost from Scott's site. Um, and we've got his uh, oops, grad students measured some of the, the different PFAS. We're looking at the PFAS when we're looking at some of these next measurements. So 0.75 in this case. So looking again at the same kind of thing, 0.775, what does that mean? in, in uh, comparison to, to 50 parts per billion restriction that CFIA has proposed. And just to put, just uh, the uh, study that CFIA and, and determining that, that, um, that limit, over 90% of Canadian biosolids contain less than 50 parts per million of PFAS. And that's in both government and industry testing. It doesn't mean there isn't zero, it doesn't mean it isn't important to test it, but the majority of the biosolids being applied are less than that. So taking that compost at the 0.75 part per billion, it would take 67 tons at a dry matter content or, 137, or 134 tons as applied. So that's at about 50% dry matter of that compost at 0.75 parts per billion to reach that 50 part per billion limit. At 134 tons as applied, you would be applying approximately 2,500 pounds of total nitrogen, 103,000 pounds of total phosphorus and a thousand almost two thousand pounds of total potash again we'd be killing the crop far before uh, with the nutrients than we would with with um with PFAS so it would require about 1200 tons per acre or 2560 tons as applied for the average background soil to double that's a lot so that just puts into perspective the numbers that Scott was showing before 
So this is, this is actually literally hot off the press. Thanks, Scott. The student sent it at 8 o'clock last night. She stayed up to 2 o'clock processing <laughs> just So there's a lot of numbers here. And, and the, the reason that I'm excited about this is because last summer we took some background manure samples, random samples, samples that we were doing trials at or, or we were at their farms. And we took a sample, asked them, okay, is it okay if we do some background PFAS and, and uh, PFAS tests? And so they were done in Scott's lab over the last half year or so. And so there's a lot of numbers here. But one of the things you'll notice is there's a, a lot of less than LOD, less than LOQ. And LOD represents the lowest concentration of chemical that can be detected by the method that they used. And LOQ represents the lowest concentration that can be quantified with confidence by the method that they used for testing. So, okay, and so the, the one that we're looking at is the one that's underlined, that's the PFOS. And then we've got, we've got a bunch of different types of manure samples. So they, they represent dairy, hogs, um, poultry, compost. There's one biosolids. There's even a fish sample. I'm just going to take a couple of them. So I'm going to take one sample that was fresh beef, one that was liquid dairy, solid poultry, liquid hog, and the biosolid pellets. Now, one of the things that, that you notice with the PFOS, there wasn't any or any that was detectable in the liquid hog. Liquid dairy had some, and Scott was telling me this morning that that's probably the rainfall happening on, on forages. That's the difference. Anyway, so I'm going to go to the next slide and put it again into that same perspective. So at 1.42 parts per billion, to get to that 50 part per billion limit, it would take approximately 35 tons per acre at dry matter, or this was a hard a hard conversion to do. Approx and I hope I did the math right. Approximately 105,000 gallons as applied, because this liquid manure was at point, it was at about 6% dry matter, of liquid manure at that 1.42 parts per billion to reach 50 parts per, per billion. So at that application rate in liquid, 1,000 gallons per acre, it would be adding about 3,000 pounds of total nitrogen, 1,500 pounds of total phosphorus, 3,000 pounds of total potash. Again, we would kill the, the, the crop long before just with the nutrients. The biosolid pellets, these, this was, was a, a different biosolid pellet than what, the, than what Scott used, but the typical application rate is between one and three tons. It would take five and a half tons as applied of the biosolid pellets at 10.6 part per billion to reach that 50 part per billion limit. So again, at that application rate, almost 500 pounds of total nitrogen, almost 600 pounds of total phosphorus, and hardly any potash. For the layer manures, uh, the same kind of thing. This was, was a solid layer, um, six and a half tons, 16 tons as applied. Again, we'd be, we'd be applying significant amount of total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and total potash. And with the fresh beef, um, about 54 tons, dry matter or 300 tons as applied to reach that 50 part per billion. So again, um, huge amounts of total nitrogen, total phosphorus and total potash. So this is just putting it into, into perspective. And, and I just wanted to share that with you because the benefits of adding the organic amendments at rates that, are, that, that match the crop nutrient needs, uh, rates that are helping to improve the soil, the soil health, those are good reasons to keep on applying organic amendments and to meet those, those PFAS restrictions, we would need to add a lot more, a lot more, and it would, it would cause uh, nutrient, dif uh, nutrient over applications. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott again for those final summary thoughts. Oh, yeah. Chemical architecture matters. Hopefully I've convinced you of that. Uh, today, uh, the carbon fluorine bond is unique, and those novel properties are at risk now. There is no question that OECD Canadian folks are following in their stead. The United States is not quite so much uh, to ban or severely restrict the whole class. That's a risk. Uh, they are widespread in the environment, and detection of every sample approaches. The instrument she's talking about, like imagine your best combine you'd love to have. That's what those things cost. But frankly, there are thousands of them around the world now, 
and these chemicals are exquisitely easy to detect. So everywhere we look, we find them. Much of the release is degraded and often into innocuous products. That is completely lost in the current discourse. You have the keen shoe ad. PFCs are extremely toxic and, they, and they're forever chemicals. Wrong on both counts. Additions of these with additional PFAS to soles Question whether it's material, I'm concluding that it doesn't. When I wrote that back in January, we hadn't done as many analyses as we've had. We cannot measure a difference. Did I? Goodness. There we go. Um, is degraded often into innocuous products. Some final degradation products may, of uh, many common use, are very persistent, PFOS and PFOA. Humans have been very contaminated. Both have declined over the past decade. Thanks for catching this. Ag cells contain background quantities of some PFAS, mostly the perfluorinated carboxylates, because they're products of atmospheric. They're exactly what you'd want to see in soil because they're indication that Mother Nature is doing a great job of removing these from the atmosphere. Biosolid compost will have some as a byproduct of consumer use. There's no question the biosolids, they consumer use, the biosolids are coming from us. So if they're in the biosolids, they're in us. If I look hard, I'll find all the pharmaceuticals. We find all the pharmaceuticals uh, that are routinely used by humans in there as well. Um, current projects are designed to clarify this materiality. We just got an OMAFRA funded study with Ryan Prosser at, uh, to do three years. Legitimately me spending more time on the farm is exactly what I like. So these are the folks that are, are really driving this, are generally viewing all PFs through one lens, persistent and potentially toxic, and moving to ban further production. I certainly hope uh, that does not come to pass, but I'm quite worried it will. In fact, I think certainly in the Europeans, and so I was in uh, Germany in um, September giving a talk, um, spent a month, uh, 10 days in China in November and got a very different response. That was interesting. But the Europeans um, are just hell-bent. And when I point out the pharmaceutical problem, that you're going to ban the use of arguably the most important chemical element in pharmaceuticals to, to, for their efficacy, you're going to send us back to the nitro days where pharmaceuticals were much more toxic, side effects were much more problematic. They shrugged. Um, I don't think AFFF foams are replaceable. The U.S. Navy will not put anything on its ships other than fluorinated AFFF foams because a fire at sea on a ship is, is a, a, a risky venture, and they do not have a replacement for those now, uh, at least uh, the latest information I have. So from a practical matter, why are governments, Quebec, Maine, Maine is, if you'll read about it in, in these biosolids, Maine's a special case. Their sewage treatment plant included an industrial facility for the production of these fluorinated chemicals. So it's very different than Toronto. It's very different than Hamilton. It's very different than anywhere in Ontario. We don't have any fluorine production in Ontario. But in that case, some very high concentrations made it into the biosolids from that industrial source, went out onto the fields, and is cycled back. Because these chemicals, their final degradation products, don't degrade any further. And they do, these are the longer chain versions, they do bioaccumulate. In a situation that doesn't have an industrial source, the primary source on your farm is from rainwater coming from just normal consumer use. And anything coming through the pellets is coming through us. So, so from a practical perspective, where are you gonna regulate the problem? Uh, if you feel that having these chemicals in humans is a problem, you need to cut it off at the source. Um, so that's the final thing I wanna say on that. Anything summary from you? There's one more, sorry. There we go. Ah, and organic amendments, this is, Applying the organic amendments to, to meet crop needs, improve soil health, will provide more benefits than the risk when considering PFAS, PFOS, PFOS for sure, and most of the PFAS. So questions? Elgin had, he's already used up two, so. Perth. Uh, so PFAS, are they concerned about Oh, sorry, I gotta give you one. So the PFOS, are they concerned when you put it on the land, are they concerned that the plants will uptake it and it'll get into the food system? Yes. That's the main concern. So plants will take this up and put That's it into the... We're doing this study with okay. Three years, we're going to study the pellets, study the soil before and after, and then follow the 
Okay, thanks. Wellington. Just to follow up on Pert's question, yes. typically in the plant then, where would it accumulate? Well, my kid, when she was in high school, uh, that paper, there's two S.A. Mayberries on there. I didn't know her, my initials were the same until we published the paper. Um, that's a silly comment, I know. Uh, into pumpkins, and it was pretty much distributed throughout the pumpkin plot because she grew pumpkins as a kid as a fundraiser. So that's, I mean, the reality is these things are relatively water soluble when they get in the plant, so they'll probably follow that. And I imagine we'll find it throughout. But water transfer bits through the plant and then out the leaves. So I expect that the edge of the leaves will be higher concentrations. Other questions? Oh, my goodness, the left-hand side. Start here, Scott. Yeah, oh, good, perfect. Thank you, Scott. Bruce. Um, question is for human pharmaceuticals. Yes. And the pellets. Yes. Um, is there a concern with feeding um, our forages to our livestock with the application of uh, human waste and their pharmaceuticals. Not in my view. And so let me, let me, wait a minute. I am an environmental chemist. I got my PhD in environmental chemistry, but I was in an environmental toxicology department at UC Davis. So I took lots of tox courses. Uh, uh, Paracelsus was a Greek philosopher thousand plus years ago. He's the one who said the dose makes the poison. Pharmaceuticals go through us at this high a concentration. They leave us at this concentration, then they go through a treatment plant and, this, and those bugs, like us, degrade those pharmaceuticals even further. By the time they get it, the dose is very low. So I don't see a significant concern there. With the one potential, certainly not in, not in your kind of application, in some water, receiving waters, some of the um, uh, contraception kind of chemicals that are uh, in that act in that way some fish species may be at the verge of having some impact from that but not i can imagine putting on soil where so those chemicals would be very labile they're metabolizable uh, bacteria would eat on them the plants would eat on them change them by the time they got into the cow concentrations would be so low i expect i would predict hypothesis no impact Move along the way. Brant. Yeah, if, uh, if we can't use biosolids on land, what would we do with them? A terrible outcome. They'd either go to a landfill or get incinerated, which would be just terrible. I had shown I'd put some um, paper biosolids back in 2010 or 11 or so. Um, and I got those because the most of those ended up going to landfills or being incinerated. But I love paper solids. Why? Well, you saw my sandy soil. I don't have a molecule of clay on that soil. I just dug, last May, I dug my foundation for my house, a basement, and at the whole wall, you could look to your, to your blue in the face. You never found any clay. I mean, it's just pure sand. So what is paper? You may not realize half is cellulose, organic matter. I like that, half is cellulose, because cellulose is expensive. The other half in these paper cards is clay, a very high quality clay, but clay is less expensive than paper. So I got 600 tons of bio, uh, paper solids, 300 tons of cellulose, and 300 tons of clay. I love that. So I save that from the, from the incinerator primarily and i like the cycle this their circular cycle um one of my locations for my hay crop is sheila's donkey farm up on 29 lisa will know that um and then the landowner across the street goes up to sheila's and gets the donkey dew and brings it back and i put it back onto the same crop the hay crop that i'm sending her hay that to me is something that we need to do I think paper solids put back, even though they have these chemicals on them, I think the net benefit is better than incinerating. That's my view. There was another one over here someplace? Actually, in Lampton. the interest of time, I'm gonna ask okay. you to just wrap up okay. Scott, on one quick question here. So given that there's uh, a lot of misinformation out there and we often get questions from folks who are getting information around these types of chemicals and potential risk uh, from social media, what do we say to those folks and how do we correct that misinformation? Can you kind of give us the elevator speech on the topic? And, and Chris might want to weigh in on this as well from an organic amendments land application perspective. P 
PFAS have unique properties that are not replaceable. They are everywhere because they're easy to detect and they, and they can be persistent. They're in us and evidence suggests not a significant amount of harm. We need to rely on our innovation uh, and our abilities to innovate and be creative at coming up with solutions. Banning is a um, unhelpful, certainly unscientific, but just impractical response to that. Within the context of what we're talking about today, extremely low risk. Essex insists. Well, we had Lambton first. Oh, so, sorry, go. Uh, I think it was Lambton, sorry, right? Essex. Yep, okay. We'll go quickly. I have a thought that my question might be similar to what Essex might be asking anyway. Um, those of us in the southern end of county, but lots of others are probably familiar with the fact that if you grow vegetables, you can't spread any type of biosolids for the three years prior. Somebody thinks there's a problem. I'm not going to suggest whether it's chemical or not, or, or whether it's scientific, I should say, or not. Uh, the other, and then the other part of my question, I guess, is that can we assume if we go across, regardless of the source of those biosolids, the chemical compounds are the same? No, I gave you the, first off, I think the, the reason on the vegetables has probably more as a biology reason than a chemical reason, just my own sense of that. Uh, and because I've done liquid and solid biosolids and so understand the liquid side. Um, there's no expectation they're gonna be exactly the same, but they're gonna be more similar because people in Toronto pretty much buy and use the same stuff as people everywhere else in Ontario. The difference is the mix of industry. If there is any uh, aspect of that in your feed, that main sewage treatment plant that had those pellets that caused so much problem, that had an industrial source of, of fluorinated thing. A couple of different plants, actually. It wasn't just one manufacturer. But as a first approximation, most sewage, most biosolid pellets, I think, are going to be more alike than not for this issue. Okay? Jess, yeah. thank you very much. Well, thank you. In the interest of time, we're going to have to cut it off there, folks, but I will happily take your questions and uh, bring them to our speakers and get back to you with responses to those. Um, please join me in, in uh, thanking Scott and Chris for their presentations today. Thank you.